welcome to the session on what are the lessons of Colombia's peace deal with the FARC for ending other civil wars. My name is Dr. Nette Edler. I am the Director um, of Studies at the Changing Character of War Program at the University of Oxford. And I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Juan Carlos Pinzon, the Ambassador of Colombia to the United States um, since 2015. Throughout his career, um, Ambassador Pinzon has been a leader in both um, the public and private sectors. And most recently, from 2011 to 2015, he, was, he served as the Minister of Defense in Colombia. And under his leadership, the Colombian Armed Forces weakened um, the country's insurgent groups, the ELN um, and the FARC, the major rebel group, um, as well as several other violent monster groups, um, which was critical in the run-up to the peace deal um, last year. Before we start the session, um, I was told to give you the polling instructions. So to get involved in the discussion, the polling team is going to put a question on the screen, um, and you can vote using your cell phones. To join the session, you should text FUTURE OF WAR 2017 to 22333, and then you will be able to vote on each poll. So the questions, um, and the directions are also on the slides. The questions is, will the peace deal with the FARC and the Colombian government hold over the next decade? Should be on the screen now. So please, if you could poll, um, <laughs> and just text A, B, C, <laughs> or yes or no to the same number. Great, okay. Let's see. Everyone ready? Great. Ambassador Pinson, Colombia has had a civil war for more than five decades with several guerrilla groups involved, paramilitaries. It has been struck by the drug trade as well, which was at the height in the 90s. There have been several failed peace processes as well. Now last year, the government and the FARC, they finally signed um, a crucial peace deal in September, but even that was very dramatic. We saw after that peace deal in September, the plebiscite um, held in, in October where the peace deal was rejected. Um, afterwards, um, the peace deal was revised. A revised version was signed in November, it was passed by Congress. And now we do finally have an ongoing um, demobilization process with the FARC. Now, it's too early to say anything about the sustainability of that peace, but it's definitely a historic um, landmark achievement. Now, you've been Minister of Defense um, under President Santos um, during the peace negotiations. How would you describe was your work relevant um, to the peace deal that was finally signed last year? Well, first of all, thank you. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, when I was invited to this wonderful event, on the future of war, I, I felt very, very honored, not only personal uh, honor, but honestly to tell the story of Colombia, which is a beautiful story, especially in this city, where the United States play a very important role in the changes and transformation we have had uh, in our country. Well, let me tell you, th th there's nothing I did, I think, and I believe that we will need to honor the Colombian military and police and servicemen forever. They were the ones who granted peace to Colombia with a lot of sacrifice. And the reason why we will need to make this peace to work is because we need to honor those who fought very hardly to obtain this uh, peace and this future to Colombia. Now, how we did it? I think, first of all, uh, there's a lot of story of leadership in Colombia. Uh, I think we had different leaders uh, for a long period of time, 15 years that were fully committed to the idea of regaining territorial control, to establishing the rule of law in the country, and somehow to protect our citizens as a main goal. And that, those goals were always maintained. And of course, we did different levels of planning at operational level, tactical level, and so on. And we review that very much. Unfortunately, small wars or counterinsurgency wars or four-generation warfare, as you want to call it, is not the kind of war people likes to talk about. And usually you don't get these great grand strategy planners talking about this. But unfortunately, this is the kind of war that usually happens. This is the most common kind of war. It happens everywhere, it happens all the time, and it requires a lot of commitment and a lot of effort because it's not just defeating a military capability of an opponent that you have to, 
By the way, you need to weaken those capabilities, but at the same time, you need to create a social cohesion, a credibility in the society, protection to the people, and at the same time, defeat your enemy's aims. So, what we did in Colombia with this level of leadership, with Colombian taxpayer money, by the way, uh, you know, wasn't Colombian resources, was Colombian soldiers and police who fought and died for this, uh, and of course, our democracy. We kept our democratic values, we uh, stick to what the people wanted, and of course, to the rule of law, sometimes even having to make strong decisions on the protection of human rights, because of the consequence of misbehavior at different points in history. But at the end, that allowed Colombia to be transformed probably from the most violent country in the Western Hemisphere, having the two most violent cities in the world by the end of the 90s, to a country that today uh, has the lowest security indicators in 40 years, uh, has overperformed in, in its economy most of its peers in the past decade, and we have cut poverty by half. And why I said this to end this point? This was not just a military security campaign, it was a national campaign to pave the way to peace in a way that we were not only attacking the terrorists, the drug traffickers, which by the way were the largest in the Western Hemisphere ever to be confronted, but also we were putting in place public policies, precisely trying to make the state work. That's the challenge in the years to come. Thank you. Ambassador Pinson, well, yes, it's true that the, the, the campaign obviously weakened the FARC, but we also know that um, it has pushed the, the conflict more towards the periphery. And I remember, for example, I was in, in Arauca at the border um, between, Ecuador, between Venezuela and, and Colombia in the south, one of the main war zones in 2012 when the peace negotiations were announced Back then, homicides rates there were 72 per 100,000, which is much, much higher than, than the global average. We also know that um, in those marginalized areas right now, um, there are still challenges because the FARC is, is not um, the only group present there. So just to think about the current situation right now, um, we have a peace deal, but what are the main challenges that are still um, in front of us? And I would just mention three. Um, that I think are, are critical. The first one is that there are many different other non-state actors that fill the power vacuums left behind by the FARC. The second one, um, that there is still state neglect in those marginalized areas. And the third one um, is how to address the issue of a um, restructured security architecture in the country. So if you could just look at those issues. First one, um, FARC is not the only group. And right now what we see in the country is a reshuffling of those groups' constellations that comes with more violence. We know, for example, that um, the EPL, one of those groups, they have in a certain region, they have more members now between 400 and 500 members than the FARC used to have in that territory. Um, and we know that some others just change their labels rather than necessarily demobilizing. Now, there was a risk that was obvious before already that there might be a power vacuum filled by other groups. Why did the government let this vacuum emerge, and how can it be addressed in the future to make sure that those other groups will not take over? Well, first, the story of Colombia is a story of conflict. When you go back and see 200 years of our history, many, many years of those 200 years have been in the middle of different kinds of conflict. In a study we did for the period 1880 to 1945, we found that we had at that time, in just that period of time, four conflicts. So we know how to end conflicts, but we know as the, at the same time that those can come back with different phase. What I foresee and what I believe and is the national uh, commitment and interest right now is that we need to take this opportunity of this conflict that we are just ending to really make all the things that need to be done in order for this peace to stay. For instance, there are uh, areas in the country in which we have regained control by the presence of the military or the police, but that is still require the presence of other agencies of the state. This is an effort we will need to do very committedly and very strongly, probably for the next decade. We need to assure that we can integrate 
those areas into the country. Another effort to create sustainable economic activity alternative to illegal and criminal economic activity. Unfortunately, all these sources of conflict, the FARC at a point, the successors of the FARC, the ELN today, criminal bands, or whomever we're gonna call them in the future, usually profit and exist by that lack of presence of the state, but in essence, funded by activities like drug trafficking, mm -hmm. that is always there if you don't compete with something, or criminal mining, illegal mining, if we don't compete with something, or human trafficking. This is why we're seeking, as we did during the uh, uh, war phase, uh, Plan Colombia as a key element, we're seeking now this new package that we call Peace Colombia to the future. And that program is crucial because we need to bring and take security, but at the same time, all these alternative activities. And that will not happen by magic. It will not happen just because we say it here. It will happen because we will need to be as effective as we were implementing a plan for 15 years to degrade the FARC to 30% of what they were. We will need to do the same kind of effort, but now to take development to those areas in a way that can be sustainable. And that, for instance, instead of people cultivating coca, which is one of the nightmares of Colombia, we can hope them to cultivate uh, palm oil, chocolate, or different products that can be connected to the country. But how do you do that? You need to take roads. You need to uh, create an economic process that allows that to, that to happen. And finally, and very important, we cannot undermine our security forces. We need to always improve them, adapt them, make them flexible to you know, be responsible for the new realities on the current environment, but we need those armed forces to be strong enough to give the guarantees to Colombian people that they can prevail and that they can assure security for the people and for, those, for all those agencies and private sector that needs to come there. That's the concept and it's a very challenging effort, but this is what we need to do and this is how we are gonna make it happen. Thank you. Well, that already relates to, to the second challenge that I see. You mentioned the guarantees that are necessary for people. You also mentioned development, which is crucial. And the second challenge to sustainable peace really is that there will be new conflicts, new grievances in those marginalized areas. In November, I was in, in Tumaco. You might know it as one of the um, well, most difficult places. Also really most beautiful difficult. places in most Earth. beautiful and right. difficult places in Colombia. And some of the leaders I talked to, they were mentioning to me, well, what should we do now without the FARC? We don't have protection anymore. Who's going to protect us? Who's going to take care of us? There was no sign of state presence. There was no sign of, of protection. We've seen recently um, the reports, the very concerning reports about dozens of human rights defenders who have been killed um, now after the signing of the peace deal. So there is quite a big risk that these grievances will fuel new conflicts, that frustrated farmers um, will lend themselves as easy recruits for other groups as well. And how can all those promises of bringing the state in how can they actually be translated into implementation? So how will you going to make the step from having those plans of territorial peace and of bringing the state in to actually see changes on the ground so that you don't lose um, the faith and, and the, the, the belief of all those people? I think it's very important not to lose sight on the size and uh, you know, the way Colombia is uh, designed. Just for many of you to remember, Colombia is two times the size of Texas, or is two times the size of Germany, has 50 million people, and has something like 1,100 uh, uh, municipalities. The municipalities Annette is describing are mainly 50 or 60 in the country that are, of course, in those marginal areas that really have some, or very much, unstable situation that required to be integrated in the country. How are we gonna do it? The way we did it with the previous 500. You know, because if I go back 15 years ago, part of the problem 15 years ago was that those 500 other municipalities were precisely under that situation. So this is a process we need to move on in, a, in an effective way. Now, homicide rate in, uh, today in Colombia is the lowest in 40 years. So of course, 
when we think about the homicides that are happening, we are very concerned. Just one, and this is a big change in Colombia, makes our system to be worried. But if I think what was happening 5, 10, 15 years ago, this is another world. So can we protect these people? Yes, we can. How are we going to do it? Of course, on one side, implementing the agreements. Those need to be implemented. Probably sometimes will need to be improved a long time. That's the thing that we will need to see how uh, by try, trial and error, if I, if I said. But on the other side, by the presence of the armed forces. That's the only true protection people have. You know? And if we can continue to bring those armed forces in an orderly way, not any more necessarily for offensive operations in certain areas, just their presence is required. I keep uh, looking to the future of the armed forces, and uh, I remember in areas that you know, Catatumbo, in the world of Venezuela, there is a town that is, frankly speaking, something like uh, 50 miles from one town to the other, but it takes more than six hours if you want to you know, move in a car. So what we did, we put the military engineers to do a road there. The road is already halfway. What I was told yesterday by someone from that area that was here in, the, in, in town was that that is transforming that region by definition. So the probability of using those capabilities of our military and our police to bring security now through other uh, operational capabilities is very important. But of course, you know, there's this hesitation coming out of the agreements that are required to be complied. There's always, in a peace process, a, an issue of trust. So, uh, you know, each side has a, 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 needs time to really trust that things are moving on the right way. As we speak, you know, a DDR process, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration process is expected to happen. The FARC, for the first time, is concentrating. We have, as you well described, in history, some failures in peace processes, but several successes as well. So as we're moving, we are with a lot of obstacles. We expect, and we should expect more obstacles, but we are moving towards the objective of this disarmament process. So maybe then let's look at the, at the third challenge, which is very much related to the demobilization process. Um, and you said, yes, it has started already, but how can this actually be coordinated? There were issues, the demobilization camps were not ready on time. Um, there was a lack of coordination, which is obviously also a challenge right now because it means that all the different agencies have to work together. If you could give one lesson of what to do and one of what not to do, in this very specific um, context of the demobilization that we can learn from Colombia, what would those lessons be? One thing that you should know, and maybe the audience should know today, is that demobilization in Colombia has been a process that is ongoing for many years. So during wartime, I can tell you that during my time as Minister of Defense, we were able to move from three demobilized persons of different guerrilla organizations to five per day. And this is people that comes looking and seeking for protection of the state, and they were hoping to regain their families, regain their future. Now, we are probably one of the few countries in the world that because of that, created some years ago a reintegration agency. So we have an established reintegration agency. It doesn't work perfectly. It's full of challenges. You know, many things can happen, but we have an institution that can provide some lessons learned and evolve to the future. Now, when you said lessons, I have to tell you that uh, you know, every time you look other countries' problem, apparently there's always a common ground for a response, and that is the need of interagency coordination. And in this time of history, it's not only internal interagency coordination, but also international and local interagency coordination. And that is so easy to say. And all of us know that that's the thing to do, but that's so hard to happen. And you know, here's where operational concepts, strong planning, and you know, very, very dedicated resources and effort to make things happen is the whole difference. And those who have been successful is because they do that. Those who doesn't is because they know they have to, but somehow they cannot perform. And that's always the challenge. Will continue to be your challenge. It's a big challenge. 
Ambassador Pinson, thank you very much for your time. Please give some applause to Ambassador Pinson. Thank you, it's a kind.